Hi, I'm Dr. Ann Peters from the University of Southern California, and today I'm going to be talking with Dr. Earl Hirsch from the University of Washington, and we're going to discuss use of CGM in patients with type 2 diabetes. So, Earl, you and I have been using CGM with patients for about as long as CGM goes back. And I know both of us really like to use it to empower the patient. So tell me, in people with type 2 diabetes or even pre-diabetes, how are you using CGM? It's a great question, and I think this is an important point. We don't use it the same as we use it in people with type 2 diabetes on insulin or even type 1 diabetes for that matter, um, because we're talking about a population that can't really do anything acutely pharmacologically uh, to change their blood sugar. Let me give you an example. I have a patient who I convinced to use the CGM once a month. It happened to be a Libre, which was 14 days. He didn't want to do it. His wife really encouraged him to do it. And the plan was he would do it once a month and always have it done the two weeks before he saw me. And what he saw is that on the nights he had a big meal, his blood sugar would spike, and he would see that with the CGM, which he did not see when he was not wearing it. And the reason why this is so interesting is that there was usually one at the most two nights a week he would spike quite high, and he doesn't take insulin. So what he would do, and he does to this day, on those nights where he spikes over 220, 240, he and his wife will go out and take a walk, even when it's raining in Seattle, and they do that. And the reality is, and I'm not gonna explain this to him, but on those nights he knows he has a bigger meal, he needs to take a walk, but this actually, um, I think, gives him the incentive and shows him how that food impacts him. I don't think it changes, in his case, I don't think it's changed what he eats and how much he eats, but it does change his behavior. And the, the, the more interesting part of the story is, is um, it's not covered by insurance, he doesn't take insulin, but um, he is now wearing it all the time. And, um, and, and, and I, th I mean, that's just the most obvious example. I don't see a lot of patients with prediabetes, but I have friends, family members, and colleagues who have prediabetes. And for not all of them, but for many of them, and I'm sure you see this too, it's a game changer in terms of lifestyle. The exercise is part of it, but the bigger part is what they eat. They don't want to see that spike, especially after drinking the sugar cola. It's those sugar colas which are the killers more than anything they, and, and, and so it changes behavior. They don't wear it all the time. They may wear it once every three months. Um, I have one guy with prediabetes that comes to mind and he wears it the two weeks before he sees me. But my guess is, is that in those two weeks, his behavior is a little different, but I do believe it's changed all of his behavior. And, and I think the bottom line from this discussion, Anne, is we really do need an RCT. We know how lifestyle impacts prediabetes, preventing them to um, cross over the threshold. We really need an RCT to show that this is effective. I agree completely because I think it gives people the power to make choices. Now, I know a lot of adults don't like to change their behavior, but if someone's interested and they see, whether it's prediabetes or overt diabetes, the impact of simple carbs for breakfast, say juice, which they think is in some way healthy, although it's not clear to me why, it spikes their blood sugar like crazy. But then if they eat an orange, it doesn't do the same thing, or they drink juice or eat the orange later in the day, it's different. So I think that even in terms of meal timing and meal composition, and then obviously exercise, it changes people a lot if they're interested in learning from it. And otherwise, they do what your patient did, which is to eat badly and then go exercise, which frankly seems kind of win-win to me. He's happy and he's healthier. Right. 
I actually, just this past week, I said something in one of my chart notes that the nurses called me out on, on a patient when he ate cereal for breakfast. I mean, cereal is just a spike. And what I told him, and I put this in the note, and the nurses got a, quite a chuckle out of this, and what I told him was, and I wanted this to be part of his medical chart, is that he is allergic to cereal. And the nurses got <laughs> such a kick out of that because every time he ate cereal, and it doesn't matter what kind of cereal, he would spike up 250, 300, every time. It's true, and I love it. Although I had one guy who's in his late 80s, and he's nearly blind, and he spikes up every morning after oatmeal. He's not on insulin. And you know what? I let him have his oatmeal because, frankly, I think it's okay. But I just find that you and I use these as insights to help patients, and I think it helps patients help themselves. The other thing, though, is that I put a lot of CGM, as we know, on just about anybody, and I've used it in my clinic in my underserved part of town where people are on sulfonylurea agents. And the variability of glycemic patterns in people on sulfonylurea agents is staggering to me. I mean, some people have these really high spikes after every meal. Some people go low. Some people go low at night. I am really surprised at the heterogeneity of glucose responses that I see in patients on pills if the pill happens to include a sulfonylurea agent. Right. I, I would take it even one step further, and there, there's data to support this, probably related to our different microbiomes, but we all respond to food differently. Um, and it's not, it's not if you're on a sulfonylurea or not, um, but I tell patients that you may see things in your CGM, how you respond to a certain food that, um, you know, I can't explain that we've never seen before, but it's, it's the way you happen to respond. And that's why it's such a self, good self-learning tool. Having said that, the biggest thing that I have to fight with some patients, it's not the majority, but they put the CGM on and then they don't look at it. And one of the nice things about the Libre and the Libre view when I, when I look at that one, and I can't see this with Dexcom, is I can see how often they are looking at it. And, and I know they're not looking at it a lot when there are large gaps in data. If it goes more than eight hours, it's gonna stop collecting the data. Um, I'm not sure how that's gonna work with the Libre 3, which we just started with, but I, I wanna know, um, you know, if it's somebody with type one diabetes on multiple injections or a pump and they're doing eight or 10 times a day, that's great. Um, but if it's somebody with type two diabetes or maybe pre-diabetes, some of those patients are looking just as much. I have a question for you. What is your record for the number of times on average people check? Because I have, I have a couple of really interesting ones. Well, it's a really good question, and I've never checked. And partly, when my patients go high or low, especially low, they check and they check and they check and they check right. and they check. So there's... It's not all the same on any given day, but That's fair. I don't know what my average is. What's the average in your clinic? Well, neither of these people have time. I have two people that I have to acknowledge this is not normal behavior. Okay, okay let's, let's start there. I have one guy that um, ended up having Wolfram syndrome. Okay, okay. I know, he was an atypical, and he was diagnosed, and he had a euglycemic DKA, blah, 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 but for the first couple of months when I started him on his sensor, it was over 100 times a day. But he doesn't do that. Now, that's not normal behavior, okay? Well, did he have a day job, or was his entire job checking his CGM? His, his day job was in tech. Oh, for God's sake. So, but I have another lady who's been wearing a, it's, again, I know how much they're checking because I can see it, and I can't see it on the others. But I have another lady, um, and she is still doing this. She's in her 70s. She doesn't have a day job. She's retired. She and her husband are retired. But she checks her averages over 60 a day, every day for years. Well, but I have the flip side. So I've had a couple of patients where the sensor and the data overwhelmed them. So I had right. one patient who actually ended up hospitalized with a psychotic break because he had bipolar disease that wasn't actually treated, 
and the obsession of checking just tipped him over the edge. And I've had a couple of people where they, it's too much. They just can't handle all that much incoming data. And it's not even that they don't know what to do. It becomes an obsession. So you got to watch it a little bit. No. So one of the things with BGM, blood glucose monitoring with the finger sticks, is you controlled how much you did it. And I'm sure, like me, you had people doing 10 times a day before we had the CGM. But the people who didn't want all that information would do it three or four times a day. Now, it's there constantly. It's too easy. You look at your phone or you look at your reader. And I totally agree with you. When we first started using the CGM a few years ago, we warned every patient about not getting overwhelmed with the data. And now it's not just looking at your phone and looking at the data. Now it's all the statistics patients get on their phone related to that with um, both the Dexcom and the Libre. And for some people, it's too much. Some people love it. They get the email every week. Uh, with the clarity, for example, to show how does their time and range compare to last week. And patients use that as an incentive. Whoops, my time and range is down 4%. I need to do better this week. You know, I love that. Again, this is all about what helps patients and what tools we can give them. And certainly also in part because of insurance coverage, but it's been hard to get CGM for people who aren't on insulin. And people who tend to use it who aren't on insulin may well have to pay for it, and they're that committed to using it. So I really think that as insurance coverage expands, we'll see more and more people with type 2 diabetes, and now we should see it on people with on basal insulin. I know we've been doing that. I certainly know people who prescribe basal insulin as a TID drug in order to get it covered, but um, we're going to see people just on basal insulin one shot a day, fine, on CGM, and Again, the amount that they'll learn and will learn is huge. So I had never thought about using basal insulin TID to get something covered. I just learned oh, come something. Come on, Earl. Where have you been? I, not in L.A., um, obviously. But that, that's, that, that's a great idea. And it's, you know, but the point you made is a point my daughter tells me every day. There are always loopholes. And that's, that's a great one. Oh, I have so many loopholes, but we don't need to discuss. No, all no, no, all these video. loopholes. But the point is, is I think this leads to patient advocacy. And I know that you and I and many others have fought really hard for patients to have access to CGM. And it's really important that all of us do that because these tools really help. I also really hate how much paperwork there is to get people devices that they need. But advocacy is important and then you know making sure that you figure out how to get it for a patient and there are workarounds um, but not yet will these be available for people not on insulin but hopefully that will come yeah and I know and I've said before we would not have had the Medicare approval for CGM despite all the paperwork and hassles we have to go through if not for you you were the main person. I mean, you really were, and I think you need to be acknowledged for that. That was, that was your baby, and um, it was great to see that happen. My big thing now is for those commercial payers, Medicaid's, and especially those states that don't have Medicaid expansion, where they're still fighting for insulin, let alone CGM. It's, that, to me, is my, 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 my greatest concern. Well, that plus the process of getting it. So in California, they made it so I could get CGM for most of my patients if they had a certain kind of what we call Medi-Cal, with a lot of paperwork. But if they had an HMO, Medi-Cal, we could get it, other people not. January 1st, they, the state decided that we were now going to have CGM for all individuals with type 1 diabetes who were on Medi-Cal, which was genius. That's great. Well, it's not great, but it's kind of interesting. So they then started a system, a Medi-Cal system for prior auth, and you had to put all this data in there. Well, it took about two weeks for that system to completely crash, just crash, Ouch. so that we could no longer get it. So the state, in its infinite wisdom, decided that they didn't want to deprive the people who'd been on it because their system broke, so they then basically said, fine. You write an order for CGM, 
for anybody on insulin, no prior auth, nothing. We just give you the CGM. It was a pharmacy benefit, both Dexcom and Libre, no paperwork. Wow. And so for the past six, eight months, we've been able to just give CGM to anybody. It's a miracle. It's like the fellows in clinic are like, here, CGM, CGM, what, do you want CGM? And it's ending. It's ending. Yes, because they figured out how to fix their computer system for prior auths. So I'm actually studying, doing a retrospective review of access before and utilization, anyone sees, before, during, when there was open access, and now that it's closed again. I, I think A1Cs are a good surrogate endpoint, but I would look at um, hospital admissions, ER visits. I think that will hit them harder. Okay, that's it's a, a very good point. It's a bigger study. Um, if you need some fellows, I have fellows looking for, this is so important, because if you can show real world evidence, um, having the CGM and then not having the CGM and showing that difference in ER visits, I think they'll change their minds. Well, I really want to make this data set good, so you've just helped me, because I was more focused on the granular, could we get it or not, versus that. Very good. All right, so I think we should probably wrap it up. Important so, interview. Earl, <laughs> do you have any last words of wisdom for people out there using CGM and people with type 2 diabetes? Yeah, I, I think the big thing is a lot of primary care physicians who have not really put their toe in the water yet for this are understandably, um, you know, n a little bit afraid, concerned, intimidated. I get that. But I think for most patients, once they have it, they will figure it out on their own and they will teach you like they've taught both Ann and me. And I think you'll see the uh, entire process to help them and help their, uh, help their overall health. Excellent. Well, thanks, Earl. It's been a joy talking to you. Thank you.